Hi, I'm Robbie, an MS reporter, and um, today I'm going to be interviewing Helen Thompson about the science of progression. Would you introduce yourself in the Progressive MS Alliance? So my name is Professor Alan Thompson. I'm a neurologist based here at UCL Queen Square in London. And one of my roles is as chair of the Scientific Steering Committee of something called the International Progressive MS Alliance to focus people's minds on progressive MS, but also on the mechanisms that cause progression and therefore identify treatments for progressive MS. Would you define progressive MS as opposed to relapse remitting? A few years ago, I'd have said that's a really easy question. But it's, it's all got a little bit blurred, and I'll, I'll start with the, with the easy bit. I mean, the easy bit is that relapsing remitting MS is very easy to define. And people have attacks, they usually recover from those attacks. Over time, they recover less and they build up some disability, or some problems, so that they, uh, it does have an impact o over time. Progression is where you see, if you design it clinically, it's where you see people getting gradually worse, independent of attacks. It has to be independent of attacks. In the past, uh, we talked about two different kinds of progressive MS. We talked about people who had developed progression after a long period of relapsing and remitting MS, and we call them secondary progressive, so secondary to the relapsing and remitting phase. And then the other group were people who were progressive from the very beginning. So they never had relapsing and remitting MS. They were always gradually or slowly progressive. And we call those primary progressive MS. And what's become more difficult or, 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 or more challenging over in, in recent years is that the differences between primary and secondary progressive MS are very slight. Uh, they really are relative. Uh, and people are starting to think of them much more as the same. The other complication is that people with relapsing remitting MS that go on and develop progression, many of those still carry on having relapses. So it's a continuum. So there's a continuum from relapsing remitting MS through to secondary progressive MS. People are saying, well, look, this is all MS. Why are you dividing it up? Really what you should be thinking about is what is happening to the patient. If they're having relapses, you should treat them with drugs that affect relapses. If they're having progression, you should treat them with drugs that affect progression. And forget about all these labels. What metrics do you do, um, use to ascertain the rate of progression? Again, a really difficult question because the clinical scales that we use uh, that you'll be familiar with, like Kurtzke's Expanded Disability Status Scale, EDSS, are very insensitive to change over time and very bad at picking up uh, progression. They tend to focus, it tends to focus on the lower limbs, whereas of course we know that progression can affect all parts of the body and much more emphasis in recent times on the on upper limbs. So there's a clinical scale, uh, which is not very good. Um, and there's imaging. Now, uh, imaging is really interesting because in relapsing remitting MS, one of the real markers of relapses are these new lesions, these bursts of activity which you see. But with progression, you're really looking at atrophy over time. So atrophy is difficult. Um, it's difficult to be really specific about it. Um, it suggests progression actually starts at the very beginning of MS and, the, and goes all the way through. Uh, and it's not such a sensitive marker. So what people are working on now are two things, really. On the imaging front, they're looking to see if they can look at more specific parts of the brain, like the thalamus, to see if that gives a better readout, a, a, more, a more sensitive marker of change. And then for clinical, I mean, they're looking at all these digital uh, uh, measures of movement and of change of movement over time, which give you a much more subtle and sensitive uh, measure. It seems to me um, all resources should be put into prevention. So otherwise, uh, then it makes everything else um, academic. Um, so, I mean, how much of a percentage of resources are put into prevention? I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I think not enough. I mean, the problem about pre prevention is y you probably need to have a better understanding of cause. And remember, you know, in MS, we, we don't really know precisely what the cause is. Some people think they do, but no, but there's no firm agreement as to what the cause is. So pre you, you can prevent disability. You know, you can tell people to 
to, to manage their vitamin D levels, to stop smoking, not to not get overweight, all the things we know makes MS worse. You can do that sort of secondary prevention, um, but actually stopping it happening uh, is very challenging. One interesting development, again, in the la literally in the last couple of years, is that we know that when we see people with their first attack, that later, you know, becomes MS. If we look back to what's happened to them in the previous years, we find that they've been to see their doctors many, many more times than you would expect. They've been complaining of range of symptoms like fatigue, like bladder symptoms that you would possibly associate with MS. So this concept of there being a prodromal phase or a very, very early phase of MS is coming into, into force. So using DMTs for relapse remitting MS day progression. I ask this, but some people um, don't want to take any drug. One of the things that has really changed over the last five years is emphasis on early treatment. There are now lots of studies that show if you're going to treat MS, that you should treat it as, as early as you possibly can, that you're likely to have better effect from your, from your drugs than if you leave it, it later on. Um, so that, that, that's sort of that, that's accepted dogma now. Uh, I mean, I still have lots of people with MS that don't want to take treatment, and that's fine. They make that decision. They, they, they know what the drugs can do, and they've decided that they don't want to do it. Um, the, the bigger question is, well, what, what sort of an effect does early treatment have on the longer term, on the 20 or 30 year uh, horizon? Does it delay progression? Does it, does it prevent progression? And I think there's evidence that it certainly has a long-term effect. I, I suppose the question about progression, and it, it, this is a sort of a really difficult question, is if progression starts at the very beginning of MS and we, we lose brain tissue right from the beginning, then if we ever find an effective treatment for progression, we should be using it right at the beginning, not, not when people enter into this phase. Are there any drugs available or in the pipeline to deal with progression? Well, there, the, the answer to that is that there are studies going on that are looking very specifically at uh, agents that may work in pure progression. There are probably five or six different drugs which are in phase two trials which are looking at uh, this group. So it's it, it's relatively early, but it, it is it is happening. Are there any biomarkers to identify when progression starts? I think clinically you can only tell if progression starts retrospectively because you know you look back and see well actually over the last two or three years this person has got gradually worse without having attacks. So it's it is a, it is often described as a retrospective uh, diagnosis. However, I still do think that with imaging markers, you may be able to pick up those people with relapsing remitting MS that are moving more quickly towards secondary progression. Uh, and there are indicators of when that's more likely to happen. And I think rate of atrophy may be one of them and rate, rate of atrophy of rather specific areas. But that's very much a work in pro progress at the moment. It's not used in clinical practice. It's more, uh, you know, research studies. Is AI using in research? I'm thinking about um, data mining, machine learning and um image analysis? Yes, well all three uh, and um, I think in the UK we've been very good at doing that, uh, taking um, imaging that's been done routinely on the NHS and you know therefore all, all sorts of different uh, protocols have been used, putting it all together, uh, uh, applying uh, a certain uh, approach to it, a certain AI approach which allows you to um, identify common common themes within the data sets and then analyzing those. And if you identify a pattern from one data set, you can then apply it to others right. and you can apply it across the board. And, and I do think, so Olga Ciccarelli at Queen Square is doing this, looking within the context of, of you mentioned precision medicine uh, earlier to try and get a sense of if someone comes to clinic, can we gather all their data, put it into an algorithm, apply machine learning and say, well, actually, these, uh, this is the treatment that would suit you best, that you'd be most likely to benefit from and most likely to tolerate. It seems to me there's a much positivity in the offing, but it's going to take time. Hopefully not too long. That was my interview with Alan Thompson. For me, the highlight was, um, do DM DMTs for relapse remitting state progression? I mean, that's important to me because um, 
I've lived through an era there were no drugs and some people don't think um, it's worth using it. I hope you like this um, episode and find it interesting and useful. Um, check out the final interview with um, Sook and um, like, share and subscribe.